Let's pray. Lord, through it all, we're asked in these next few moments that you will be glorified, that you will be honored, that Jesus is exalted, that everything that is said strengthens your people to trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, if you have your Bibles, can you turn to Genesis 39, verse 21? Thirty-nine, twenty-one, And I'll read it, just half of that verse. But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him. He granted him favor with the prison warren. Now this is a challenging passage if you really take time to understand what the author, who is Moses, the author behind the author, which is the Spirit of God, is saying. And this is what he's saying. That Joseph is in prison, which doesn't sound fun. There aren't too many people who really enjoy going to prison. Or using it to brag on. Maybe a rapper. Maybe a heavy metal artist. But not everybody is excited to go to prison. Anyone in here excited to know? All right, just checking to see who we had in the room anyway. But it's interesting because I, I know a lot of people who brag on it. I know people in my family. I know people that I've interacted with who brag about going to jail and doing some things. But for the average person, it doesn't sound fun. And this is what's happening here in this passage. The Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him while he was in the midst of a situation that seemed to be horrible for the average person. It isn't about where he was, but it seems like the passage is trying to highlight something that's important. And that's who was with Joseph in prison. And who was with Joseph in prison? The Lord. That's awesome. That's great. But I don't know about you. I would love to have the Lord with me. I want him to be with me everywhere I go. I just would like to skip prison or problems or trouble or bad situations. Amen? Like, like, I, like, Lord, be with me, but just be with me in all these great spaces. And it seems like over and over as we're going through Genesis, the Lord actually shows up in hard, harsh, challenging situations, which ultimately would be an encouragement for us. It doesn't matter where you are or what your location is. It just really matters who's with you. All right. We're going to dismiss and go, right? That's, that's, that's all you really need, right? You can go face this week or whatever you got going on right now because the answer to whatever's going on in your life is who is with you. Well, let's look at Joseph's situation. How did Joseph get here? Last week we, we dealt with Abraham. And Abraham, he has two sons. He didn't have faith. He was struggling, tripping, messing things up. And it seems like the Lord fixes it. He maneuvers it and works it out. And then it concludes with Abraham having this tremendous faith. And he ends up in the New Testament of just this great man of faith. But he stumbled an awful lot. From his two sons, one of them continuing the bloodline is Jacob's father. Let's turn back a few pages Jacob's father has two sons. It's Esau and himself. And even in the womb, back in chapter 25, these two jokers are wrestling. They were twins, and they're beefing in the womb. And I, I have two boys, and I've watched them wrestle and tumble. I could not imagine two twins swinging it off on each other outside of the womb, maybe on the streets. But in the womb? And mom prays, and she's like, and this is chapter 25, what's going on here? And it says that two nations are in your womb, two peoples will come from you and be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, the older will serve the younger. 
It's like, wow, there's something going on with these two kids. Um, they are uh, born. One is clinging to his brother's heel, and then the shade begins. The first time the shade starts off is in verse 27 and 25. It says that one of them was a hunter, so he's an outdoorsman. He's, he's, he's you know, fixing cars, doing all types of stuff. And the other one was a homebody. He's an introvert. He doesn't go out, but he can whip those pots. And one day his brother comes home, and he's hungry, and he's like, bet, I, I got some soup. It's crazy good. Like, I got all types of onions and garlic in here. It's dope. And his brother's like, all right, let me get a bowl. And he's like, sell me your birthright. It's like, What? Like, how, did he, how did we jump to you coming after my birthright? But yet he really did, Esau didn't really care for it. He's like, look, what good is it if I die? So give me some of that soup. And so he gives him some soup. Like, it seems like a small thing, but that's pretty shady on his brother's side. Like, this is a crazy conflict. This is, this is just kind of wacky. But Esau has just been after this promise from the beginning. Then the scripture continues going on. Verse In chapter 27, we find that now ultimately the birthright is stolen. Verse 5 in chapter 27, his mom, Rebecca, was listening to what Isaac had just told his son Esau. He says, hey, go out, go, get, go do this, go do this, let's make preparations because I'm about to give you the blessing. And Rebecca hears, his mom, overhears, like, oh, man, he's about to bless Esau. And so she says, yeah, Jacob, come over here, come over here, come over here, come over here. Listen, oh, we're going to put a plan together so that you can steal your brother's blessing. Like, this is crazy, right? Like, like we're going to put a plan together. It's like someone saying we're going to put a plan together to steal your Bible or to steal, like, something that God's going to get. Like, this is, like, all wacky and crazy. Mom's in on it, and, and they're like, all right, but, Mom, how are we going to do that? She's like, look, I got a plan. I'm going to make this stuff for here. I need you to go out here and do this. Take some of that skin. Put it on your arm because your brother's hairy, and you keep it clean. Like, it, it, this is going to work. It's going to be great. And ultimately, they trick their father. Well, trick the father. He blesses Jacob, Esau finds out about it, which you don't want to mess with a guy who is an outdoorsman, right? Like, he's in, like, Jacob ain't ready for that work with his brother, but he stupidly does it, and his brother hears about it, and he takes off running. And where does he go? Well, he ends up going to his uncle's house, his mom's brother's house. And what happens to this trickster? In chapter 29, he gets deceived over and over again. And this is the beginning of Jacob's life. Being a trickster, getting tricked. Then he has a bunch of kids who are shady, just like him, raised in this household of craziness with all this stuff going on. Laban comes after him. And then um, in Shechem, uh, they, they commit geno- his kids commit genocide in trying to defend their sister, and then they take off again. And so inside of this household uh, of all this stuff going on, Jacob has his final son at this point, which is Joseph. And now what happens in a household of such great dysfunction? Obviously, things work out. No, no, no. He favors his brother, his son, Joseph, over the rest of them. In fact, he favors him so much, he gives him a special cross colors down jacket to rock in front of his brothers. Like, like it is the most ridiculous, bad parenting idea of all time. It's like, look, I just want everyone in this household to know. All of my boys, every, all the girls over here, all the people who work here, this is my favorite. But, right? And, and just in case you miss him, I'm going to put a colorful cross colors, long sleeve robe thing on him so that he can walk and parade throughout the house in front of you. Could you imagine that being in a household and, and your parents saying, this is, this is our favorite. Leave him alone. Wait, well, he just punched me in the eye. So what? You deserved it. <laughs> that, that only would incite foolishness. And yet, this is what he does. And one day, Joseph, raised inside of that, has a dream. And he says, hey, guys, hey, brothers, guess what? I had this dream. It was, it was, it was awesome. You, I, and I'm sure they're already rolling their eyes. We don't like you, Joseph. We don't care about your dream. And then he shares the dream. I'm better than you guys. And they're like, oh, we, we hate you too, more. And then he has another dream. And this time he has a dream and he tells his parents. And in this dream, he's like, look, dad, mom, dad, everyone, come here. I, I got to tell you guys this dream. I had this dream. It was awesome. All of you guys were worshiping me. Yeah, he can't read the room at all. Like, like he, 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 no one taught him. He didn't have the skills to, to go, you know, maybe I should keep this to myself. He shares it with everyone. His brothers don't like him. Even his father goes, who, what, who do you think you are? And this is his favorite. And he's, who do you think you are? 
And so one day after this, his brothers were out tending the flock and, and doing what they do. And dad says, hey, your brothers are in Shechem. Remember, Shechem was the place where they'd commit genocide. His dad still owned land there. And they were like, take the, take the animals there to feed for a little bit and go, go check on your brother. So this is what dad's doing. He's just not a genius. Go police your brothers. Go see what they're doing and bring back a report, you little snitch. I mean, my favorite, right? Like, he knows. He's just like, this is my boy. And so Joseph is whirling with his little coat, and he's on his way down to go snitch on his brothers, and he finds out they're not where they were said to be, and they were somewhere else. And so he goes over to where they are, and they see him coming from afar off. And this is what they say. Here comes this dreamer. Ah, this dude, man, he, look, look at this little corny coat. Like, I can't stand this snitch. He's, he's only here to snitch on us. And you know what? Let's kill him. Like, wait, what? Like, why didn't one of the brothers go, whoa, 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 wait. Like, how did we just leap all the way? Like, we could beat him up and we can like, like no, no, let's just kill this dude. And let's see what happens with his little dreams. And so they snatch him up and they, they throw him in the pit. And this is, this is one of those scenes that sometimes you got to hear what's not being said. Can you, because it says that they sat down to eat while Joseph's in the pit. And can you imagine the talk? over the fire, um, how they don't like him and, and what they are going to do to him. And, and so uh, one of the brothers is like, oh, this, this will break dad's heart. And, and, and they're negotiating, and then their cousins come through, and they sell him into slavery into Egypt. So, this, this, so they didn't sell him into slavery into Egypt because they were like, ooh, he's not going to die. They sold him because they didn't care what was going to happen to him. They sold him into slavery because they can get, at least they get some money out of it. It wasn't to preserve his life. It was like, well, we can get a couple quarters out of this, right? We can get some change out of this. Like, like it, maybe this won't all just be a waste. And, and so they, they take him, sell him, take blood of an animal, put it on his coat, take it back to dad. Hey, uh, we found this. Breaks dad's heart. And Joseph is now sold into Egypt, into Potiphar's house. Joseph's now an employee in Potiphar's house. And yet he raises up in leadership, and he is seen, and Potiphar's like, God is with this dude. And, and so, you know what, let's just give him some space to keep operating and doing things. And then Potiphar's wife sees him one day. Obviously, he must be cut because it says that he was good to look at. And so she's like, you know what, hey, man, <laughs> slow down there, boy. Come on, come on over here. And he's like, no, 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 chill, girl, chill, I, I got to go. And this is what Joseph says with his integrity. Like, after she's pursuing him, he's like, look. How could I do this to my master? And how can we commit this great evil before God? <sighs> integrity. You know what he gets for that integrity? She lies on him. He gets thrown in prison. Mm. He's in prison. Because he decided not to sin. He cared about what God thought. And he wanted to honor the person that he worked for. And he is now rewarded with being put in prison. And this is where this verse comes from. But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him. His reward for wanting to honor the Lord was a hard situation. But yet even in prison, God's presence was with him. Now, Oftentimes, I'll use me for an example. I'll leave you alone, okay? Oftentimes, my hardships don't make me love God more or really look at myself. It makes me look at the person or whatever has caused it, and I start having a problem with them. But not Joseph. Joseph is better than me. Look at chapter 40. It says, after this, the king of Egypt's cupbearer and baker offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officers. Verse 5, the king and the Egyptians' cupbearer and baker who were confined in the prison each had a dream. Both had a dream on the same night, and each dream had its own meaning. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they looked distraught. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were in custody with him in his master's house, why do you look so sad today? Uh, there's a couple of things uh, for us. All right, I started with me, now I'm bringing you into this. There's a couple of things for us to consider with Joseph's life 
uh, when we go through or when times are difficult. Joseph didn't use what happened to him, how he was rejected, how he was sold, how he was treated by his family, how, how all these things had gone wrong, how Potiphar's wife had, had lied on him, how Potiphar didn't believe him, how he ended up in prison to cause him to miss the people who was around him. Think about it. He had every reason to go, man, if it wasn't for Potiphar's stupid wife, I wouldn't be here. If he would have just believed me, I wouldn't be in this situation. Right? Like he's got plenty of reasons to complain, to argue. I'm in prison. I'm locked up. I tried to do right by God, and he isn't using what he's doing in those moments. In that moment, he's in prison, and these two guys are, it says, distraught. They're confused. They're concerned. They're worried. He is sensitive to their need. He's only sensitive because that's his heart. He's in a space of challenge, pushed down, and he's still being sensitive to the people around him. Please don't miss the people around you and what God may be trying to do in your life while you go through or while you're where you are. And Joseph didn't. He's like, hey, guys, what's going on? Why are you down? Right? Like, like he had every reason to miss them and be like, man, this is, this is wrong. I didn't do anything. And he is sensitive. He is responding. He is present with them. And it isn't phony or fake, right? You ever, you ever like, phony and work yourself up to care about someone? Oh, what's wrong? I don't really care. I'm just saying it because it's the right thing to say. It's like, no, no, guys, what's, what's going on? And look, look what he says to them. They say, we had dreams, verse 8. And they said to him, but there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, don't interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. So the chief cupbearer told him his dream. And Joseph interprets both of their dreams. One had, one's interpretation was good. The other one was like, Ugh, you probably don't want to know this. You probably just want to keep going. You probably don't want to know all the details of what's about to happen and what this dream means. Don't let your challenge, your disappointment, and your discouragement be a waste. And what I mean by that is we um, hosted a funeral a few months back, and um, the title of my sermon was Don't Waste Your Pain. And, and there was just nothing really good about that moment. But what could come out of it is you using for fuel some of that pain to do good things for the Lord. Like there isn't a bunch of great things to pull out of this moment of tears and pain, but it could be utilized for good things that the Lord may want to do for other people. And one of the illustrations I used was uh, when I was in Ohio one time and my cousin was killed and it broke my heart and, and, and just listen, and seeing what's happening between these young men and the one who took his life. And I realized in that moment that I'm going to work very hard so that young people can hear the truth about who Jesus is and they can know that God cares for them and that we can use some of this pain to do good things in challenging communities. And so from that moment forward, I had dedicated my time as a youth pastor, working in the projects, working in communities to do good things for people who need to know truth. I didn't want to waste that pain. And that pain fueled me to make sure young people had someone in their life that they could talk to, that they could feel safe with, that can encourage them. And part of that was fueled by this broken heartedness that I had with losing my cousin over a silly decision between two 16-year-old boys. Don't waste your pain. Don't waste your proximity. Don't waste your location. Don't waste where you are. It, 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 yes, there are times to go, man, this is jacked up. And then now let's look around and see what does God require of me in this situation? How do you go through? What does God require of me in this moment, in this time? He didn't posture himself he didn't miss them. He saw them. And so, 11 years in jail, well, 11 years total of, of being in prison on this stint, being in Potiphar's house. And so he, he interprets the dreams. And so there's two options here at this point, right? It's like, all right, this dude is going to be released, and he's going to remember me because he's going to be restored, and he's going to put a word out, right? And, and then they're going to release me. And guess what happens? The guy forgets him. Two more years, he's in jail. It's like. That would, that would have soured me at this point. I would have been like, all right, bet. I'm tired of this. But he doesn't. Joseph's heart stays straight. And so, verse 41, 
It says at the end of two years, Pharaoh had a dream. He was standing at the Nile. And verse 16, it comes down where Joseph is, is called because the guy finally remembers him. And he goes to give the Pharaoh the interpretation of the dream. Verse 16, I am not able to, Joseph answered Pharaoh. It is God who gives Pharaoh a favorable answer. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, in my dream, I was standing at the bank, and he gives him the whole story, and Joseph listens, and then Joseph begins to give him the interpretation. Basically, it's this, right? There's some hard times coming soon, but there's going to be a time of plenty, and so you guys need to prepare. You need to build out some places because it's going to be hard in a few years, and so prepare yourself, prepare all of Egypt, and look what Joseph says in verse 33, which is super cool. So now, let Pharaoh look for a discerning wise man to set over Egypt, the land of Egypt. This is what he's saying. He's like, all right, you, you need someone who can facilitate this and manage this. And so, listen, this is what's going to happen. Um, there's going to be a famine, but before the famine is going to be years of just plenty and enough. Prepare yourself, make bigger spaces, bank some of this stuff, bro, because it's about to get hard, and you need to get someone to help facilitate it. And Pharaoh goes, you know what, I want you. It's like, well, me? Look, look, at, look at Joseph. Joseph is giving the king, he, his, his heart is like super clean. Because if it was me and I would have been in prison, and I'm giving him the, the answer for what to do for all these people. I'd have been like, you probably need a guy who can help facilitate, get me out of prison. Like, help, get me. He's not even trying to sell himself. He's just saying, you need someone who can manage this and do right for the people. And Pharaoh goes, you're the man. And so he is placed and second in command, he's in the second chariot. He's given a ring. He, he is now given the uh, authority. He is, he is the man now in Egypt. He has gone from uh, uh, being hated in his family to being thrown in a pit to being sold into Potiphar's house to being um, rejected and thrown into prison, being forgotten in prison. And now he is second in command. God's providence. God has been superintending all of this. What does providence mean? Providence is the governing power of God that oversees his creation and works out his plans for it. Let me say this again. Providence is God's governing power that oversees his creation and works out his plans for it. It's not a throwaway part of the sermon. That is the sermon. That, that is all this is about. That is all I want to encourage you with today is that God's providence, God is always working. God is at work. It doesn't matter where you are, how you feel, what it looks like. Joseph did not know God was working. How could God use this for good? God is always using things for good. In fact, Romans 8.28 says, and we know that those who love God, that all things work together for those who love God and called according to his purposes. That's not a kind of maybe. And oftentimes we don't really want to hold firm to that passage of Scripture because we know a lot of bad things happen. So how can it? And this is the truth about God's providence. It is bigger than our situations, our circumstances, and our moments. That ultimately, always, every time, with, without any excuses, without any uh, fumbles, or even in the midst of fumbles, and even in the midst of discouragement and brokenness and bad reports and, and, and storms and all types of things, God is working good. I'm going to say it again because you don't really want to receive it and believe it because it sounds like, well, it, it, my situation, it really has an argument against God. God is always working good. God is always, we're in the midst of man's schemes to do evil. God is always working good. Providence is a doctrinal understanding that God is always in control. He is the superintendent of all things. At the same time, bad things happen. And we are not privileged to always know the secret counsel of God. But we can rest assured that he does turn out in the end things to be good out of mess. He is at work. He is involved. He sees it even when it's fuzzy for us. Amen? Proverbs 19, 21, many plans are in a person's heart, but the Lord's decree will prevail. The ESV says, many are the plans in the mind of a man. I have a lot of plans. I do. This wasn't one of them. 
but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. When I think of God's providence, I think of Mordecai, you know, Esther's uncle, who, who, who was a day away of being hung. He didn't know it, but his enemy was already plotted and preparing for him to be destroyed. And the king has a dream and said, well, well, he couldn't sleep, actually. The king couldn't sleep. And he goes, hey, go get me the newspaper, the, the chronicles. And basically, he's like, what, what happened today? What, what were some of the events that happened? Oh, oh, king, as, as they're reading this, I guess he's using it to go to sleep. It's kind of like some of y'all comments on Facebook. I don't read them because they're super boring and long. Like I, like, I don't show up for them. And this is what the king is saying. Hey, give me some of that boring stuff that happened today. And so he's reading him all the stuff that happened today. And he finds out that Mordecai had done something great. And he goes, did, did, was Mordecai rewarded for what he did? And they're like, nah, we ain't do nothing for that joker. He's like, nah, nah, get him. Let's do something. And he sees Mordecai's enemy walking through Haman, walking through the gates. He goes, hey, Haman, what should be done for a man that's done some great things? And he goes, oh, obviously, you're talking about me, king. Well, these are all the great things that should happen. This is the complete opposite of Joseph, right? In the midst of a situation where he could flatter himself and make himself great, he doesn't. Well, what does Haman do? He, he says, you should do this, you should do that. And he goes, bet, do that for Mordecai, the guy you hate. The king didn't know he hated him. And God used that through his providence. Through his providence. He's not the only person. We're about to get into Exodus. And uh, Moses, the baby. He has no power. He has no ability. He has nothing. And God is superintending. The first thing the Lord does is he uses the midwives. That the, that the Pharaoh has ordered to kill all the babies. And the Bible says they feared the Lord. And so they didn't. And then Pharaoh calls them to the carpet. Could you imagine being called by the most powerful person in the region to call you in and to question you why you aren't doing his command? And they were like, look, Pharaoh. These women are strong. Before we get there, they be having them babies. And so the, the people were blessed. And, and this is what's interesting in that passage because I never thought about it before. So they have a bunch of kids. And, and the Israelites are just, just fruitful, multiplying. God is blessing them. And it is in the midst of that blessing that causes more of the hatred from the Egyptians. Like God's blessing caused them to be more frustrated with them. Which ultimately seems like, well... You ever have a thing that just kind of goes like, man, this sucks, this is horrible, whoo, this is great, this is awesome, then it's like, boom. Then the great, awesome thing causes more problems. So I was like, Lord, it would been best if we just never started this, if you just never gave me the car in the first place for the engine to blow up. But what happened in the blessing and then the pain and the persecution was it caused their hearts to cry out for deliverance from God. It caused their hearts to not look for Pharaoh to deliver them, to not look for anything else but God. They cried out to, and the Bible says that God heard them from heaven, and he came and delivered them. There are often times where I look for chariots and other things to deliver me or for people to remember me. And I need to remember that there is an architect who doesn't miss anything. There's a gentleman by the name of John McLeod. You may have never heard of him. He's not real famous. And he served um, in the Korean War. And one day uh, he, he had paid up his rent at his, the place where he was staying for a year because he thought that they would be there uh, for a long time. And then he finds out that he's being reassigned to go somewhere else. And when he looks at his new assignment, he's being reassigned to go where the fighting is very intense. And John's upset. He's frustrated because he paid his rent up for the year. And now he's being deployed somewhere else where he could possibly lose his life. And so what does John do? John goes downtown and he starts drinking. He gets drunk. He hangs out. Uh, he spends a bunch of time there. And then he finally decides, I'm going to just pull myself up, go report myself in, and take my punishment. John gets back and, and, he, and he shows up. And like, like he's expecting, I'm going to get punished. I, I went AWOL. And he says, John, John McLeod turning himself in. And he stands there and they say, John, you're dead. Like, what, what do you, what, I, I, I know, no, 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 like, you're, you're, not, you're not alive. Like, the plane with all of your guys that went up crashed as soon as it took off. You were supposed to be on that plane, and yet you're alive. John finishes up his time at war. He goes home, marries this, this sweetheart he'd known his whole life. 
They have their connecting child, Irene, which is my mother. Now, I would ask my grandfather plenty of stories, and when he told me this story, there was no hint in this story that he loved Jesus and Jesus spared his life. No, there there was no hint that he was a righteous man because he had gone AWOL because he was just fed up with the orders he was given. But the king who superintends everything, why? Because God has a plan, and no man, no idea, no famine can thwart God's plan. And so when we go through, it is very helpful to say, Lord, I don't know exactly what is happening and what is your call for this moment, but I do know this, you are good, and I love you, and I trust you, and I know ultimately you're going to work this for some good. I don't see how any good can come out of this, but, man, I can't wait to, to finally get it all one day. So hang in there. My grandfather wasn't the only person I would ask questions to. I, my great-grandmother, May Charles Wilson, she was born in 1913. I would ask her questions all the time. I would sit at her knees. If you have people in your family who you've never sat down with and asked questions, I encourage you to sit down. I'm the only person in my family who has many of these stories. And, and if you can, get some time to sit down with them, to just ask them questions. How did you and Granny meet? How, how did this happen? And why did y'all move to this area? And, and Granny told me this story one day. She said, when I was little, Daddy, now, mind you, my Granny was always old my whole life. She's my great Granny. So she was like, when I was born, she was an old lady. Like, just was always old lady. And so to hear my great Granny call her Dad, who was my great, great, great grandfather, Daddy, was hilarious. It's just like, you had a Daddy? Like, I thought, I thought God was your Daddy or Moses. Like, you old. <laughs> And so she's like, yeah, Daddy uh, was at the front, and he yelled at all of us to put all the animals in the back and, and run them all to the back. And we didn't understand. And then after a while, Daddy was standing on the front porch with his shotgun. And on the front porch with his shotgun, he was waiting, and the Ku Klux Klan marched down the street. I'm thinking through this story. Anything could have popped off. Anything could have happened in that moment. And it didn't. They kept marching. And they were preserved. And for me, those are the stories that get me through. This is why over and over and over in Scripture it is said, do this in remembrance. Remember because you leak and you're going to forget. You need to write down and journal those times that I brought you through and delivered you. And you, you thought it was over and you thought it would happen. And it even, none of it really made sense at the time. But you need to write it down because sooner or later some of this stuff is going to start connecting. That This isn't about me. It's about God and his glory. His glory. Lord, do this for your glory. Lord, take some of this pain and use it for the betterment of the people around me. May, may, I, may I use some of these tears to fuel me to make sure others don't have to suffer through these things. Joseph. He had a jacked up family. He had a lot of reasons to give up. He had a lot of reasons to compromise, right? Right? His brothers were shady. When Potiphar's wife came to him, he had all the training to be a shady man. He had it all. Like they, they, they trained him well to be a pervert, to, be, to just take whatever you see in front of you. There, there's a time where, where Esau and Jacob were about to come back together, and Jacob was scared because he's like, oh, my gosh, my brother is going to kill me. He's still a gangster. And so uh, he was like, you know what, I'm going to put the slaves out first and their children, and then I'm going to put kind of, you know, the people in my household who I don't really like, and I'm going to put my favorites. And the last person in this story who he put out was uh, Joseph and his mom. Me and Paul were talking this week about how, like, we don't value people and humanity. And he put the people in his life he didn't care about the most in harm's way first. Only to find out in the irony that the person who he favored the most, that was his precious, Joseph, was going to be a slave one day. This is his prince. The irony. A couple quick notes before we bounce. Joseph's location, God's kindness to him in prison, is an indicator or a reminder that no matter where we are, with God, we're everywhere we need to be. You need to stop complaining about that job, that place, that house. 
is God with you or not? We spend a lot of time trying to get somewhere when we really should be spending a lot of time with the one that will get us through. David, he's in the middle of recognizing his sin with Bathsheba. And he pins this psalm. He says, be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion. Blot out my rebellion. Completely wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. He's recognizing he has sinned. He is recognizing he has rebelled against God. He is acknowledging I, I've done some jacked up stuff. Against you and you alone I have sinned and done this evil thing in your sight. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Surely you desire integrity in the inner self. And you teach me wisdom deep within. Purify me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Turn your face away from my sin and blot out all of my guilt. God, create a clean heart in me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And do not banish me from your presence or take away your Holy Spirit from me. Do not banish me from your presence. I can go through this knowing that you are with me. I can go through this. I can deal with this. I can carry some of this knowing that you are carrying it with me. Remember in Philippi when Paul and Silas was in jail? Same thing. It says at midnight they began singing worship songs. I don't know if Paul had a good voice. I don't know if Silas did. But I'd like to imagine in that moment they started harmonizing like boys to men. <laughs> you ready, Silas? I'm ready. You ready, Paul? I'm ready. All right. Break it down. <laughs> Sometimes you just need a good inmate. Sometimes it's, it's, it's who are you locked up with? Who are you going through this with? Who, who can you bounce off and laugh and remember God's goodness with? For Joseph, he just had the Lord. The Lord was an inmate with him. If there's anything that COVID has taught us, it taught us that our company is very important. Who we spend those challenging times with. And what Joseph's life is saying, that he is spending challenging times with the Lord. You will need to know that he is with you when you go through some of the things you go through. And you also need to remember Romans 8, 28, that all this stuff is going to work out for good, even when I don't know how. This is why our jobs are more than what we do. <laughs> it's who we do it with. Right, everyone's like, man, I just want to get more money. I just want to get, get this sweet office over here. And, and we never really pray about, well, who are my coworkers going to be? Who are the weirdos I'm going to be locked up and confined all week with? Like, that's an important part of this prayer list. I don't want to be working 40 hours a week with a bunch of. You see, your, your company can push you on. And the best company, the best person to be confined with. The best person to harmonize with is the Lord. He was Joseph's benefactor. He's the one who made a difference. He's the one who made prison something he could survive because he wasn't alone. And it was God's presence in the prison that caused everything he touched to be blessed. But here's, here's the thing that uh, Joseph learned. He learned at the end of his life, finally, why? And this is what he says when he looks over his life. Genesis 45. His brothers were nervous because they had been brought back into his life. The famine had called them to come to Egypt. They realized that Joseph is, is, the, is the guy and, and they're afraid because like Joseph's going like what we did to him. And Joseph is healed. And he says, listen. I was going to slap all y'all. 
a few, I've, I've had some dreams of slapping y'all. I've seen, my, I've seen the spit fly out your mouth. But I realize, and I'm not angry with you guys anymore. God himself has sent me before you to preserve life. This is what Joseph is saying. This, I thought, and I could have spent time thinking this was about me, but I realized the king of the universe was using part of my life for good. Many lives are spared, and, and, and you all will be preserved, and, and, and Egypt is now a place where people can come for safety, for protection, all because of what I went through. And no, God does not do evil or bad things, but he does use it for good. And so, nah, y'all are good. Look, look at this passage in Psalm 105. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Proclaim his deeds among his peoples. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell about all of his wondrous works. Boast in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face always. I love that. Remember the wondrous works he has done. His wonders and his judgment, judgments he has pronounced. You offspring of Abraham, his servants, Jacob's descendants, he cho- his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments govern the whole earth. He remembers his covenant forever. The promise he ordained for the thousand generations. The covenant he made with Abram swore to Isaac and confirmed in Jacob as a decree, and to Israel as a permanent covenant. I will give the land of Canaan to you and your inheritant portion. When they were few in number, very few indeed, and and resident aliens in Canaan, wandering from nations, basically y'all ain't have nothing. You were nobody. He allowed no one to oppress them. He rebuked kings on their behalf. Do not touch my anointed ones or harm my prophets. He called down famine against the land and destroyed the entire food supply. Verse 17, he had sent a man ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. Now, the writer of this psalm has some information that wasn't given to us in Genesis. He says in verse 18, they hurt his feet with shackles. That The prison was real. And the pain, it was real. His neck, they put an iron collar on it. Until the time of his prediction came true, the word of the Lord tested him. Which means Joseph's lonely nights for 13 years was real. Those shackles were weighty, and that iron collar around his neck was not fashioned. Now, this was a real person with real pain, with real tears, with real abandonment issues. And the Lord, in verse 19, is being ascribed as a person who was working on Joseph. This is Joseph's dark room. Back in the day before we had cameras on our phones and everything we own, we... we my generation, we had to like have these, had film inside these little ugly, hideous, big things that we would go around and take pictures, and we would take about 24 or 37 pictures, and we'd never know if it was a good picture or not. It's like I spent all this money on this film, I got this goofy camera, and I'm taking all these pictures, and I'm like, boom, 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 and then I got to take it somewhere for the film to be developed. And so the person will, right, you got, you got thumb marks on it. Like, just imagine how quick you take a picture. You go, up, oh, trash. Next one, boom, boom, boom. Back then, we didn't have that. You had about a week or so until they created, like, 24-hour film development. But either way, they had to take the film, put it in a dark room, and develop the film. And in that dark room is where the, the picture is actually being pulled out, where you can see what was being taken on it. The dark room of our life, the development portion, this is what was happening with Joseph in prison. And it says that the Lord was... With him, but it wasn't just the favor on him, it was the Lord's presence on him to get him through. He went from a silly boy who's bragging and arrogant and all types of things in the midst of a broken, challenging, dysfunctional family. He never let go of God. He held on to God when he had no idea how God was going to do it. 
He was failed over and over. But the dark room in that prison, in that time, please don't try to fast forward through the dark rooms of those seasons where God wants to do something in your life. So don't, over, don't talk over it. Don't Facebook over it. You need to sit still sometimes in the presence of the Lord and be quiet. You just need to just be there with him and his word and, and worship and, and maybe a great playlist and, and, and hearing the truth of God that all things work together for the good. All things, you, like, like you need to receive that and know that all things work together. And you need to be able to say that with some authority in the midst of challenges. Lord, this hallway that I'm in. Is whack. It's wiggity, 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 wiggity whack. Like, it's, it is real whack, Lord. And, and God's okay with you being honest. God, this is whack. He ain't like, oh, I can't believe you said that about my process. No, God, this is bad. I don't like it. But, but this is what I know. You are good. There's no evil in you. Nothing about you is evil or bad. And it would be crazy for me to even ascribe to you that you are capable of evil. Like you're good, good, you're good, good. Very good. I know I'm not very good because I know my thoughts and my ideas and the things that I do and how I I like to manipulate situations, but you're good. The situation isn't good, but you're good, and so if you're in a situation, you will work the situation out for good. Like this is, this, this, this is how we got to talk. Because if you don't and you let go that the, that the doctrine of God's promise, that he, he, is, he, is, he is capable of superintending every single thing that is happening in this universe, you will be very, very challenged in challenging situations. It will be very hard. You, you need to be reminded. You, you, you need to be encouraged. You need to be strengthened. And that means you need to be around some people who are not going to tell you foolish things like Job's friends or his wife. It's like, you, you love that God, man. Why don't you just, like, let him go? No, no. Mm-mm. Lord, some of us are in the hallway. Some of us are, are in the, the room where you are developing us. And, Lord, the, the work behind the scenes is not fun. And I know I cry sometimes, Lord, for you to just take some of this weight off of me. Lord, could you just silence some of these critics? Can you just silence some of this stuff? Can you just... But then I'm reminded that there are plenty of passages where you give us wings to fly over storms. But more times, you like to give us an anchor to make it through. And so I don't know if you're going to fly us over this one or if you're going to keep the weight because you want to build muscle. Whatever it is, Lord, give us the courage to stand with you. Lord, I love how Joseph rebuked and every chance he got, he pointed away from himself to you. He said to Potiphar's wife that this is an evil thing against uh, your husband. This is an evil thing against the person who trusts me. And this is hideous before the Lord. When it came time for his gift to be used, he said, it is God who empowers someone to interpret dreams. And when he's standing in front of the most powerful man in his time, he looked past him. To a king who reigns forever. And so, Lord, help us get perspective. There's only a few things that will matter 10,000 years from now. For those of us who have trusted in you as our Lord and Savior and all of our hope rest in you, we will be in your presence. And probably the only complaint would be, man, I wish I would have done more for the Lord while I was there. I wish I would have had faith in those moments where I punted and gave up and retreated. Lord, help us hang tightly to who you are even when we go through. And remind us 
Give us a glimpse that you are there, that you are a very present help in times of great trouble. And that you ultimately work things out. It's usually not what we would have written or desired, but you are good. And you are at work for some good things. So, Lord, as we go through, I pray we can go through with that encouraging song in our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. I ask you guys to stand.